Now turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20. And this morning we encounter yet another one of those biblical phrases that is now have now passed into common usage, doubting Thomas. It usually refers to a skeptic who refuses to believe something without direct personal experience or evidence. There's a children's book called Doubting Thomas, 1935 film starring Will Rogers, Doubting Thomas. Very common to hear this still used. Even the, the atheist Richard Dawkins makes a reference to him in his book, The Selfish Gene, although in his typical exaggerated and upside down light. And this is another one of the events that only John records for us. And as we've been becoming familiar with some of the themes of John, Thomas's response to Jesus is fitting with the rest of the gospel. And of course, it's appropriate and fitting when it comes to the person of Christ. That is to worship him, to humble yourself before the Lord and worship the Lord Jesus. So we'll begin in verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when, the, when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprints of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors having been shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. So Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believed. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the fact is that all Christians on whatever level, struggle with doubts at some point. And this narrative provides us with some important and fundamental bulwark against the kind of doubts that can often make a shipwreck of your own faith and mine. Let's introduce this disciple named Thomas. He's mentioned three times, other than in the list of the disciples in the Bible, all here in John. Now you know that he's called Didymus. Well, that's the Greek word for, for uh, double or twin. Sometimes it was used as a name, but to be honest, we probably don't know what Thomas's actual given name was. And unless your name is Thomas, I don't think we have any Thomases this morning. It may surprise you that the modern name Thomas comes from the Aramaic word, teoome, which again means twin. So let's just keep calling this man Thomas. That way we know exactly who we're talking about. And according to church history and popular church tradition, I mean, there's, there are historical records of this. Apparently, Thomas traveled to India around 50 A.D., he evangelized around the area of what is now Madras, possibly establishing as many as seven churches. And I think it's interesting that the so-called skeptic ends up being sent to an area where there are historically millions of gods within the pantheistic framework of Hinduism. He is eventually killed near Mayapur at around 72 A.D., and according to the local tradition, he was thrown into a pit and then pierced through with a spear thrown by one of the Hindu holy men. 
So what else do we know about Thomas? Well, from what we can gather from the rest of Scripture, he might be what we would call a morose individual. That usually means that a person is kind of gloomy and maybe a little sullen, maybe kind of a pessimist. Some people rejoice to see the glass half full, but Thomas would be, well, you're still empty. He's full of courage, though, but he also possesses this, this streak of, we might even call it fatalism. It's just going to happen. Might as well get it over with. You know, they make a joke about us Calvinists that, you know, you fall down the stairs and you say, oh, I'm glad that's over with. In John 11, when Jesus and his disciples hear about Lazarus' death near Jerusalem, which is the center of Jewish opposition to Christ, what, is, what does Thomas say? Let's also go that we may die with him. And the next time we see him, he's setting up that very famous, I am the way and the truth and the life statement from Jesus. John 14, 3. Je Jesus is telling his disciples, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also, and you know the way I am going. Now that's, that's good news, right? Well, what does Thomas say? Lord, we don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? <laughs> so in the middle of Jesus making these precious promises to his disciples, Thomas interrupts with this kind of unnecessary statement. And remember the old movie, Kelly's Heroes? Always with the negative waves, Moriarty, you know. But here's the thing. Again, Thomas is not a coward. He's ready to die with Jesus. And he's, he's not even afraid to just be out with it and say what's on his mind. He's going to pose this difficult issue. We don't know where you're going. How are we supposed to know the way? Actually, he's not even afraid of appearing ignorant. You know, the old saying, it's, it's better to uh, keep quiet and have people think you're ignorant than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Well, Thomas is the second kind. He says, I don't care. And finally, here in John chapter 20, Thomas's character and nature are really manifest. He, not only is he slow and reluctant to believe, but he's also, we would say, stubborn. He's obstinate. Unless I see, he's setting up the terms of his own belief. Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger in the place of the nails and put my hand in his sides, I will not believe. And I, as I was preparing this, I was thinking, where do we put the emphasis here? Unless I see this stuff, I will not believe. Or I will not believe. Well, regardless, this is his attitude towards his fellow disciples. He's made his position clear. He stubbornly wants proof. And he's demanding evidence. Now, his point may have been that he didn't believe what they were saying. Their report was, we have seen the Lord. And in the Greek language, when it says... And they were saying to him, that means they weren't, they didn't just say, we saw Jesus and that was the end of it. They were continually saying, no, Thomas, no, we saw him last week. He showed up. I'm not going to believe. Now, we might be tempted to look down on Thomas for his lack of faith. But as I said last week, remember, they were all in the same boat a week ago. In fact, they were still mouth agog open and Jesus had to say, well, you're, not even, you're not even offering me food, you guys. Do you have anything to eat? They were all in this state of befuddlement. And notice again, here a week later, what are the disciples doing? They're still huddled together in a locked room. They're still scared. They probably still feared arrest. They knew that Jesus was alive, but that knowledge didn't give them the courage that would be the fruit of real, authentic trust in the Lord. Again, all in the same boat regarding their fear of the Jewish leaders. So it's a week later, and this is probably the same room that we read about a week ago. 
The doors are again shut, probably locked, and Jesus shows up again. And what does he say? He says the same thing he said to him last week. Peace be with you. You're all terrified, huddled together. At least Thomas is here this time. Peace. It's a word of comfort. Shalom. Irene in the Greek. It's, 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 not, it's, it's not just a ceasefire. It's peace, wellness, completeness of life. Be with you. And in the text, we read here, as soon as Jesus says this, Thomas doesn't put up a fight. Verse 27, he says, peace be with you. Then he turns to Thomas and says, okay, you, reach here with your finger. See my hands, reach your, feel where the spear went in. And don't be unbelieving, but believing. We notice here, Jesus invites examination. If, if only we were so confident in the truth of the gospel. Go ahead. I had nothing to lose. I have nothing to hide. Check it out. Jesus is no charlatan or, magi or magician. He puts himself forward as the exhibit. Touch me and see. And I think the issue here isn't that Thomas was some kind of stoic or Epicurean skeptic about truth. No, no. Jesus knows who his sheep are. He knows that Thomas isn't an agnostic skeptic or doubter like that. And he graciously says, Thomas, right here, reach here with your finger, see my hands, put your hand into my side. And as we said last week, most theologians believe that the Lord Jesus carries these wounds of his into eternity almost as trophies of his conquest of death. And note, his, his beaten and disfigured face does not carry into eternity, just his hands and his side. And Luke writes his feet as well. And see, I, I think one of the things we can at least take away from this is that our confidence in the truth should also invite examination. We're not fedious. You know what a fedious is? Someone says, just believe. Faith in faith. It's good enough. When we encounter those outside the faith, we can be so confident in the truth of Christianity and the truth of the gospel and in the power of the Spirit to draw his sheep that we can just be out with it. I like what Matt, you guys were bringing out in Sunday school. It's, it's, this, it's some kind of bulwark against the fear of man where everything isn't hinging on just how you phrased it because guess what? You're always going to phrase it a little off. You're not perfect. It's, the strength is in the message itself as it's carried along by the Spirit of God. We can be so confident in Christ as to recognize that without him, no one can ever know anything truly. And for certain, nothing is independent of Christ's authorship and authority. And, but that's a whole other sermon. So Jesus also gives Thomas, secondly, a little more of an admonition than what the other disciples received the week before. Now remember from last week in Luke's account of this, uh, from, a, from a week ago, he says, why do doubts arise in your hearts? But here it's more pointed and it's a command. And he says, do not be unbelieving, but believing. It, it could literally be translated as don't be without faith. See, up to this point, we know that Thomas has dug his heels in with the other disciples, he actually set the terms of where the threshold is for his faith, and he made all these terms known. And the other disciples didn't do that. They, they just kind of lost their minds. So while, yes, Jesus is very kind and patient with Thomas, just as Jesus is kind and patient with us, when, when our doubts arise that are unfounded, God doesn't just cut you off at the knees. He's kind. He continues to bring 
whether it's by word or by uh, fellowship or by other Christians or by a sermon, whatever, he brings that into your life so that you're strengthened in your faith. He allows Thomas to actually interact with him right at the point where the Romans had cruelly wounded and killed him. There's kind of a sense when, when Jesus says, don't be unbelieving, it's almost like, okay, all right, Thomas, enough. Cut it out. Don't continue with this whole thing of I won't believe. I love how J.C. Ryle in his commentary on John says this about the Lord Jesus. He says, he does not reject him, Thomas, or dismiss him or excommunicate him. He comes again at the end of a week and apparently for the special benefit of Thomas. He deals with him according to his weakness. And like a gentle nurse dealing with a forward ch child, reach here your finger, behold my hands. If nothing but the grossest, coarsest, most material evidence could satisfy him, even that evidence is, is supplied. Surely this was a love that passes knowledge and a patience that passes understanding. Amen. I am so glad that God has treated me with patience and not cut me off at the knees either. So Jesus kindly interacts on this level. And secondly, as I mentioned, we see how fully and immediately Thomas responds to Jesus. There's, there's no comeback, there's no but, there's no argument, no hesitation. And really, this confession of Thomas's has been central to John the whole time, revealing and magnifying the full deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas answers and said, my Lord and my God. Think about that. My, my Lord and my God to this resurrected Lord Jesus. I, I often think anyone who desires to remain in their own unbelief regarding Christ's nature as, as God Almighty, they've got to come to terms with this statement and with the response of Christ to it. He says, my kurios and my theos, my Lord and my God. This, the second word, theos, we know what that means, theology. Study of God, theos, is, is God, the supreme God, the, the, the ruler of all, the triune deity. And in the New Testament, the word kurios, where we get the word Lord here, it also denotes supreme authority, but it can be used in different contexts. So sometimes kurios is used for owner, like in Luke 20, 13, speaking of the Curios or owner of the vineyard. It can mean master, like we read in the parable of the talents. The master, the curios, gives his servants talents. It can also stand for Yahweh, which is the tetragrammaton, that, that four-letter word that stands for the covenant God of Israel, as in and an angel of the Lord appeared, an angel of the Curios, meaning Yahweh. Now, most of the time, when you read through the New Testament, you don't be surprised how many times the Lord, like the Lord, the Lord requires this, the Lord this, standing for Jesus, that's a consistent theme. But there's just no mistaking. The Unitarians are wrong here. They have no leg to stand on. There's no mistake about what Thomas means when he calls Jesus both Lord and God. This isn't like we would, you know, the Spanish word for Lord is, is what? Do you know what it is? Señor. Lord. And where we just came from in Alabama, I, I really do kind of like the sir, ma'am. It's very polite. You know, again, I'm not going to judge whether they really mean it or not, but as part of the culture... And you, you respond in a respectful tone. It's very respectful, y'all. You know? Ewans. But this isn't a standard greeting. This is worship. 
He's actually worshiping Jesus. Do you remember back in John 8, 58, where Jesus says, before Abraham was born, I am. And the Pharisees pick up stones and are going to stone him. Remember, Jesus doesn't correct some kind of misunderstanding or misapprehension on their part. He slips away from them. The same here. There's, there's no explanation further to Thomas. Oh, wait, Thomas, I'm, I'm just, I'm like an agent of God or I'm one of God's angels. And Hebrews blows that away. There's no rebuke. Jesus receives worship from Thomas. And it's just amazing to me that anyone could misconstrue Christ's claims to be God in any other way than what we have right here. My Lord and my God. This must be the response of someone who has met Christ and, and seen the risen Lord. But even those of us now, as we're going to read in just a second, we haven't physically seen, but we have had our eyes opened and seen the Lord Jesus Verse 29, Jesus says to him, because you've seen me, you've believed. It's a question. Blessed are they who did not see and yet believed. Now, how many of us grew up hearing that this was some lesser or greater degree of faith? The ones that need evidence, that's, eh. The ones that don't need evidence, well, they're the more spiritual ones and, yeah. I don't know if it was explicitly taught, but that message sure got through to me. Well, Christ here, what does he do? He recognizes that Thomas has believed that Jesus is risen from the dead and he was his Lord and God. Even though his faith was, you know, slower in coming than the, the rest of the disciples, it was a little late, it was sure and certain. And actually what just happened was completely suitable for Thomas. And ask yourself this. If Thomas is supposed to be such a bad example, in the sense of needing some kind of evidence, then why is Thomas the only one singled out as having worshipped Jesus in response? When he finally does believe, my Lord and my God, I don't hear that about any of the other disciples. They may have, but it's not, it's not in the text. And we've all heard this in one way or the other. Thomas needed evidence, not me. My faith is more genuine because I don't, I don't need to see Jesus. That's not it. <clears throat> Jesus responded to Thomas with a blessing on those who would believe in his resurrection without seeing Jesus' physical resurrected body. I don't think this was a rebuke of Thomas for needing evidence. More than likely, he was meaning that those who believe on him without seeing the resurrected physical body of Jesus are just as blessed as Thomas and all the other dis uh, disciples who did see him as well. See, we don't, we don't believe because Jesus appeared and said, here's my hands and you touch them. We believe based on the apostolic testimony and witness of those men. And we who believe in Jesus based on that testimony are not greater or lesser disciples than the ones who saw him in the flesh. Well, that's not the point. There's a, there's a blessing attached to both. Remember, all of the, the disciples saw Jesus physically. And John wrote again in his first letter, that which we have seen with our eyes, touched with our hands. This is what we proclaim to you. Again, Jesus is not obligated to do this same thing over and over forever. He established his church at one time through the apostles, and we build on that. So no, Thomas is not a lesser disciple because of this. It's, it's just amazing how Jesus responded to him, not because he had to, not because, well, since Thomas is demanding it, I guess I'll do it but it was grace, graciously responding to Thomas in this way. 
So John continues with this theme in the last two verses we'll look at this morning. Verse 30, Therefore many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So this is not just an afterthought. This is continuing, blessed are those who believe. Therefore, many other signs. And the authors of the four Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, quote, wrote without any view of temporal benefit to themselves or others, but to bring men to Christ. To bring men to Christ. And in order to this, they persuade men to believe. And for this, they brought to the world this divine revelation supported by all of its due evidences. That's Matthew Henry. These apostles went to their deaths so that we would have this morning, April 18th, Rachel's birthday, by the way, April 18th, 2021, that we would know what the truth is and that we could be set free because we've known Jesus and we know and are known by him. And I think that when John wrote uh, many other things not written in this book, I think he meant us to understand his gospel. He's not talking about the whole Bible there. But we can also safely conclude that this entails all of the other signs that Jesus did that aren't specifically written down in John or in any other book of the Bible. Remember, he was seen by his disciples for 40 days and showed himself alive to them by many infallible signs, not all of which are recorded. Acts 1.3 says he presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So yes, there were other signs that Jesus did after his resurrection that we don't have written down. The reason they're not written down is because God didn't see fit that we would have to know these things. We have way more than enough proof and convincing evidences that Jesus is indeed the Lord. And then John concludes this part of his letter with his mission statement, as it were. These have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. When we began this series way back in May 5th of 2019, we began with John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In other words, Jesus is God and created all things. And I'm going to quote myself from that very first sermon. I think I can do that. I quote other people. Jesus never came into being since he has always been. This eternal logos, the word, is a person. Ideas, abstract concepts, or metaphors can't bring galaxies into being. They don't exist face-to-face -face in relationship with anyone. This is your Savior. He is the unique God-man that you may, what does he say? Pistuo, that you may believe. That's to entirely entrust yourself to this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the unique, one and only Son of the Father who has, what does John tell us? Has exegeted, has revealed God to us. He's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the other theme of John, that believing you may have life in his name. Think, just think with me for a second, the, the efforts that were made yesterday morning at the South Bend Women's Clinic. What's, what's that all about? Well, you, you could put in a lot of, oh, it's about this, it's about that. But at its most basic core, it's about life. Because our culture 
does not like life. It thinks it does, but it really loves death. It, it has failed to find God's wisdom. It has rejected God's wisdom. And so according to the Bible, our culture loves death. There's a whole cult of death out there. Morose, always down, depressed, nihilistic, nothing matters. No. This is the opposite of God's life. This is the complete bipolar opposite of why Jesus came to give life and give it to the full so that by believing you would have life in his name through Christ alone, in Christ alone. This is the greatest result of the greatest gift ever giving. given. It's life, not death, life, abundant life, truly free. Not free from physicality like the pagans think, but free from the horrid and fatal curse of law and of sin's misery. We just read that this morning. So let me tie this together and apply it. How do, you might be reading the story of Thomas and say, well, that's me sometimes, you know, unless I'm convinced or something like that. I'm having trouble believing. I love how my, my son Aaron will, will talk about, you know, he has, he has some lefty friends in his video world. And they're like, well, I just can't believe that that a donkey talked. I just, I just have trouble with that. Aaron says, what are you talking about? That's not the central part. What about there was nothing except God and God spoke and now there's the universe. How's that for you? Okay. But how do we keep, I know it's kind of, my son's like me, only nicer and more terse. So yeah, you have to get to meet him sometime. How do we keep from being like, how doubting, doubting like Thomas? Well, first, First of all, if you're a believer this morning, you have access to God through Christ in prayer. It sounds Sunday school, it sounds simple, but we must go to God in prayer when you experience this kind of doubt. That may be the very reason that God allows you to fall into periods where you're not quite as sure as you should be so that you learn to depend on God through prayer, growing in grace will include times of doubt and times of great faith. The overall path, the trajectory, the direction of the Christian life is towards more solid faith, not less. Better belief, not lesser belief. Confidence in God. Like the man in Mark 9 who brought his demon-possessed child to Jesus, uh, we go to God because we do believe in him. And we ask him for even more faith. God, help me. What did, what did the man say? I do believe. Help my unbelief. Right. And secondly, realize this, that, that we just did a series on it in the fall. This is, this is spiritual warfare. We battle every day against all kinds of things. I mean, from our balcony in Alabama, you'd look down and those waves never stop. It is constant, in, out, bang, hitting that shore. That's, that's the world in you. The world wants to grind you down to powder. Mm -mm. We have to be prepared. We need to be armed with all of the means of grace. Do you read your Bible? How's that for a start? Do you read the truth of God? But not only that, we, we have all kinds of means of grace. We have the fellowship of the saints on a weekly basis. That, that's something God has provided for us. The word is the sword. That's an offensive weapon. And our defense is faith. It's that shield, which Paul says will extinguish all of the flaming arrows of the evil one. All of those whatabouts, what ifs. And thirdly, and I think this is, this is important. And Steve, you, you reminded me of it a couple weeks ago. There is a, a, a settled resolve in your very being that I believe is, is born of the Spirit of God that says, this is true. 
It's not that we do it without evidence because what, what does Psalm 19 say? There's two, two books of God. Day after day, the heavens pour forth speech. It's not ambiguous. And then there's the revealed propositional truth of God. And once that is seated so deeply in your, in your very being, well, nothing can shake it. Now, does the, does the enemy give up trying to shake it? No. Uh, this is why we need to be so careful about listening to godless ideologies, not just because they originated somewhere godless, because they are godless. They are set up to divide you from Christ and divide Christian from Christian. It's one of the reasons we support Founders Ministries. They realize that once you let a couple different camel noses into the tent door, then it's all over. The whole camel's going to come in. I just, I just saw a video with a once orthodox seminary professor who has now begun imbibing some of these ideologies. And now he's at the point, no longer is, is his stand on an inerrant, infallible, sure word of God because he's been so influenced by that. That worldly ocean has banged against the shore of his life and it's begun to crush that rock into pebbles because he let it happen. I mean, remember with me, how many times does Paul say, don't be taken captive, don't be deceived? He's talking to Christians. So you need to make sure that you're settled, that you're standing on rock, not like the man who builds his house on the sand and when the storms come, the whole thing just comes crashing down. So Christian... We have two things that Thomas did not have. We have the indwelling regeneration of the Holy Spirit. If you're in Christ, you've been born from above. And we have the written New Testament, which was only not even begun at the time of Thomas's doubting as far as being written down. So by both the, the power of the Spirit and the power of the Word of God, we can overcome those silly doubts and, like Thomas, be prepared to follow Jesus anywhere. We should say with Thomas, well, let's, let's go with him, and if we need to, we'll die. Well, yeah. You got nothing to lose. <laughs> I mean, you really don't. And like the so-called doubting Thomas, we can say, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, I know that's, that's a little bit lofty. That's out there somewhere. Well, in reality, that means we live for him until such a day as God calls us home. Not doubting. Sometimes those, the popularity of the skeptical culture with younger Christians now there's an old word for that. It is unbelief. They don't trust anymore. And they like to th say things like, well, I, I love God. I just, I was hurt. I don't, I don't need the church. Sorry. Not true. So trust Christ. God, God sent his son into the world so that he would redeem you from every wicked act, purify himself, a people, a particular people, that are eager to do good, who love God, who worship him, and like Thomas, will bow before the king anytime, anywhere, my God and my king, my Lord and my God. So we can be like Thomas in that way. Amen? All right, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this historical narrative, this inspired section of Scripture. And we thank you for the example of, of a man like Thomas and even importantly of the grace and patience of our Lord Jesus. And Father, help us to walk in solidity of faith and in integrity of action and speech. Help us as your people to continue that trajectory, that direction towards maturity, a fuller faith, fuller confidence in your goodness. And Lord, whatever it takes, help us to learn great and greater dependence upon you as we grow in this Christian walk. We thank you and we give you all the praise. 
We ask it for your glory. Amen. Amen.